Okay, so uh, deep learning is like a really powerful technique uh, that's been widely used in the last seven or so years. Um, it's a very powerful algorithm for machine learning. And typically, uh, the way people do deep learning is they, they have some task, like classify, the, classify different digits, handwritten digits. And what you do is you have a deep learning model, and then you have like a huge amount of training data, like 60,000 images. And you, you uh, throw all of these images into a, into a convolutional neural network, like ResNet or something. And after training for a few hours or a day or something, then you have a neural network that does really well. And say you have some other task, like, uh, like CIFAR 10. This is images of like cars and animals and stuff. Same thing. You have like 60,000 images trained for a few hours, and then you have a great model. OK, so this is a really great technique. But, uh, but what, if we, what if we don't want to have like 60,000 images? What if, what if we only have a few images? So what can we do then? And, uh, and we know that this might be possible because humans are able to do this. So humans don't need like 60,000 images to classify a cat versus a dog. We might, we might just need like one or two images. So humans are really good at this. So say, uh, say I asked you, like, this is a sparrow, this is a partridge, and then what is what is this one? <laughs> okay. So it turns out this is a partridge and a pear tree. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, so clearly humans are very good at this. I think even a, a little kid that hasn't seen a, a sparrow or a partridge before would be able to get this correct. And there's even some like style transfer going on where this is this is even like a cartoon, and and the partridge is like head on, but, but humans are able to figure this out really well. OK. And humans are also really good at meta reinforcement learning. So, so it doesn't take too long for a little kid to learn how to ride a bike. And, and maybe after playing like five or 10 games of chess, a human will already have a pretty good strategy that, that works pretty well. Um, OK, so why are humans so much better, than this, better at this than deep learning algorithms? Well, one of the reasons is that we're not actually just learning a single task. We, we have our entire life's experience to draw back on. Like first we might learn tic-tac-toe and checkers and then move up to chess and go. And before we learned to ride a bike, we probably learned how to crawl and walk. Whereas a machine learning algorithm, it knows nothing at all at the start. Like, like if we train a, a machine learning algorithm on handwritten digits, it doesn't see anything before, before it sees those digits. Whereas humans would first, first uh, see some handwriting, they might learn the alphabet, et cetera. And so we, we have a lot of experiences before we look at these digits. OK, so, so uh, that, that's why humans are much better than these deep learning algorithms. OK, so now what can we do about this? How can we design deep learning algorithms that also make use of prior tasks or prior experiences? And this is the idea of meta-learning. So meta-learning, uh, these concepts have been defined since the, the late 80s uh, by Schmid, Huber, and Bengio. And uh, the idea is that exactly what I was describing with humans. We want to use prior knowledge to learn faster and learn with less data. And there, there are many different techniques to do this. It's a, it's a common uh, problem in machine learning. Uh, and so formally, we have some meta training set, which is a set of training and validation data points. Maybe these are like animal images. And then a meta test set are training and validation data points from new classes that we haven't seen yet. Okay? And the, the goal is to learn quicker on the, on the meta test set than if than if we didn't have the meta training set. Okay. So there are many, many different works that, that uh, do meta learning. One popular approach is to use a recurrent neural network to do this. Um, and I don't have too much time today, so I'm only going to cover some of the most popular ones. Okay, so probably one of the most popular meta learning algorithms over the past five years has been model agnostic meta learning, or MAML. So I'll talk about that one next. And then I'll talk about another approach that uses GANs. 
Okay, so before I jump into model agnostic meta learning, I want to give some motivation to the algorithm. And the, the idea is that it uses fine tuning. So fine tuning is this really good technique. So say we want to uh, classify images of Darth Vader and Yoda. So this, this doesn't seem like that hard of a task. So maybe we only need like a thousand images each. But, but say we only had like 100 images. So one way we can do better is if uh, we look online and find a pre-trained uh, uh, pre convolutional neural network on ImageNet. So ImageNet is like the, the standard huge image data set for image classification. And, and there are many, many pre-trained models online. And the idea is that instead of starting from scratch just on Darth Vader and Yoda, what if we can use the power of this ImageNet classifier? And, and that's exactly what we do in fine tuning. So the idea is that uh, in the first few layers of the neural network, the model learns things like, like different, uh, like how to detect edges and how to detect curves. And then in the middle, it starts to learn like a bit higher order features. Like it might say like, oh, these two edges make a nose, these circles make an eye. And then at the very end, it's like, okay, like two eyes and a nose make a human face. And so uh, if we do fine tuning, we can keep all of these layers the same and just uh, retrain the, the final layers. And, and so that's what we do if we want to classify Darth Vader and Yoda. We, we keep all these the same and then uh, retrain the neural network just on the, on the last layers with Darth Vader and Yoda. So then we, we, we like run stochastic gradient descent and do gradient updates just for the last layers, but, but keep the, the first layers fixed. And the, this, this approach works pretty well. So maybe we can get down to like just 100 images each instead of 1,000 or more. But what if we want to do even better? So say we wanted to do this with just like one single image each of Darth Vader and Yoda. Well then, if we, if we do fine tuning, then uh, our model will just overfit. It'll say like, oh, there's a green pixel right here, so then it's Yoda, and then it, it won't generalize at all. Okay, so, uh, so how can we do even better? And this is, uh, so now I'll describe the, the approach the model agnostic meta-learning takes. And the, uh, it's a pretty simple idea. The idea is, uh, so, Say we had some deep neural network and we could just take a single gradient step with just a few images to get a pretty good classifier. So that, that would be great if we had that. So, so now the idea is what if we just optimize to exactly have that? Optimize so that we only need to take a single gradient step and we'll, we'll get a good classifier. Okay, so that's the idea. Before I, before I get into the, de the details of the algorithm, I'll just go through a bit more notation. So uh, in standard machine learning, we have some features and a label for each data point. So in, in my example of object classification, the features would be like the pixels of a cat and the label would be cat. And then our goal is, is uh, say we have a deep learning model, our goal is to learn some parameters theta that, such that uh, our model can correctly, correctly predict the label for each, uh, for each data point. Okay, so now in MAML, we have as inputs a task, and, a, and our test set is also a task. So a task will be like a set of, of labels. Like one task will be classify cats versus cheetahs versus mountain lions, and another task will be like R2D2 versus C3PO, and another task would be like classify these different uh, types of furniture. Okay, so then, then the training set are these different tasks, like, uh, like these two tasks will be the training set, and then the test, and each of these tasks have training and validation sets of their own. And then the test set will, will get only the training, the training set of, the, of a new task that we haven't seen before, and then we need to correctly predict the, uh, the test set of this task. Okay, so now, uh, on the previous slide, I said, let's, let's try to build a model such that we can just take a single gradient step towards a new task and have a, and have a pretty good model. So, so uh, this is the approach that MAML takes. 
Okay, so the idea is, uh, say we have three tasks, like task one, two, and three, and say that, say that if we train a deep learning model, the, the optimal parameters for these models will be theta star one, theta star two, and theta star three. Okay, so then the, the goal of MAML is to learn a pretty good, uh, is to learn an initial theta that's like right around the center between all of them, such that if we, if we look at the, uh, the gradient step for each, for each task, and we take a gradient step, we'll get pretty close to the optimal parameters. Okay, so, so the goal of MAML is to learn this, uh, this uh, set of parameters such that we only need to uh, do a single gradient step. Okay, so formally that's written on the right. So we want to find the, uh, the theta that minimizes this expression, which uh, so, so uh, P of T is, the, is our distribution of tasks. And for every, for every task, we want to minimize the loss incurred by the model such that the model is uh, taken one gradient step. Um, uh, the, the deep network takes one gradient step uh, towards uh, optimizing that model. Okay. Okay, so now I've explained uh, uh, what we want to optimize, but uh, now I need to tell you how to actually solve this optimization problem. And it turns out that we can just use gradient descent to do this. Um, and, and so I'll explain on the next slide how we, how we do gradient descent. But I want to I wanna note that uh, the, this is called model agnostic because this framework can work for any, any machine learning problem as long as you can uh, run gradient descent on it. OK, so, so I'm going to keep running with my example of image classification. But this works just the same way on uh, reinforcement learning problems or, or any other problem. Okay, so here's the full algorithm. Again, it's, it's a pretty simple algorithm, but it's a, it's a very powerful technique. So the idea is that uh, at training time, we first we random in, randomly initialize a, a deep network, and then in every, in every iteration, we sample a batch of tasks. So this will be like classify a cat versus a cheetah versus mountain lion. And then for each of these tasks, we evaluate the gradient with respect to the, the training examples and uh, basically compute one gradient step. And then, uh, and then once we do this for all of our batches of tasks, we update our, our model parameters theta by taking the gradient of, of, uh, of the loss of, of all these tasks after taking one gradient step. Okay, so basically the takeaway is that the test error on each task is going to be the training error of our meta-learning procedure. All right. And uh, if, you look, if you look at this expression, you might notice that there's actually second order terms here. And I mean uh, terms where you need to take two derivatives because, uh, because each theta prime is a derivative and then we take the derivative of that. Um, so th this can be computationally expensive. But it turns out that there are, there are ways to uh, approximate the second order derivative with just a first order derivative. And this, this still works pretty well. And then it's much more efficient. Okay. I won't get into uh, how, to, how to do that in this talk. But uh, if you're interested, um, you can talk to me later. OK. So this is model agnostic meta learning. And here are some examples of experiments that, that they did. So this is a reinforcement learning task where the agent either needs to run forwards or backwards. And so uh, when it goes back to the start, before they run any gradient update, they, they train a model. Basically, it's like running in place, ready to either run forwards or backwards. And then when you take one gradient step in each direction, so if you take a gradient step to uh, optimize for running forward or optimize for running backward, it'll immediately uh, run forward or backward. Okay. There are also experiments on Omniglot, which is like a, a benchmark meta-learning object classification task where, where there, there are like 1,600 different, different uh, letters from different alphabets. And, and so MAML does, does 
really well on this data set, better than like all prior techniques for meta-learning. So it's a really interesting idea because you, you might not expect to, uh, to do so well um, just by taking a single gradient. Like you might, you might not expect that it's possible to learn a single model such that one gradient step for every new task will do so well. But uh, it turns out that MAML uh, works really well and it's, it's uh, got a lot of attention in the last few years. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about one other approach for meta-learning, and it's called uh, data augmentation GANs. Okay, so the intuition behind data augmentation GANs is a bit different, and the idea is that, uh, so data augmentation is a very uh, popular technique for image classification, and the idea is that, say we have some data set and we don't have a whole lot of images, um, so how do we get our model to, to generalize better? And the answer is to uh, just perform random crops to, to each image that we have, or random rotations, or, or even changing the colors, or, or, doing, like, uh, or doing skews or something to, to the image. And the reason is that uh, a deep neural network, it might, it might, uh, it might, uh, uh, overfit to the training set if you don't have too many images. Like, for instance, it might learn a rule like if this pixel right here is tan, then then it's a house. But if you crop it so that the 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 house is is a bit to the side, then it won't be able to make these these uh, overfitting, and it'll be forced to generalize much better. Okay. And, and this technique improves the performance even for larger data sets like ImageNet. And it's, it's really vital if you have a small data set. Okay. Okay, so, uh, but uh, for images, it's, it's really easy to tell that like cropping an image probably isn't gonna change the label. But what if we have some other data set where it's like non-image data set? What if we just have like a huge Excel file where full of numbers and we don't know how to augment the image? So, so then uh, the technique I'm gonna describe will, will allow us to automatically augment uh, new data. Okay. And the way it works is by using a GAN. So I'm just gonna give a brief overview of uh, generative adversarial networks. And these are a really powerful technique for, for generating data points. So these, uh, these photos of the people down here, these are actually generated by a GAN. So these people do not exist. They were created by a computer program. Okay, so, uh, so GANs are this cool technique where there are two deep learning models, a generator and a discriminator. And they sort of play this game against each other where the generator tries to output realistic data points, and the discriminator tries to tell whether, tell whether a data point is real or fake. Okay, so, so uh, they're, called, they're called generative adversarial networks because they're a generative model and the training is adversarial, where these, these two models are competing against each other. Okay, so in a standard GAN, the, the input of the generator is gonna be some random noise, and the output is a, a fake image. So if we're training on uh, the MNIST data set, then it'll try to output like the number eight. And, uh, and the goal is to output more and more realistic data points. And the discriminator, its job is, it takes in as input either a real image or a fake image. So a real image from our starting data set or an image generated by the generator. And the goal is to correctly predict whether it's real or fake. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the data augmentation GAN. So this is gonna work a bit differently. So in the data augmentation GAN, the input is gonna be both a random vector and a data point, and it needs to output an augmentation of that data point. Uh, so, so a fake data point. And the goal is to output a uniformly random data point within the same class. Okay, and then the discriminator 
instead of just getting a, a single data point as input, it'll get a pair, either two real data points or a real and a fake data point. And the goal is to guess whether it got a real and a real or a real and a fake. And in the case it gets too real, it's just two randomly, uh, randomly chosen data points from the same class. And in the other case, it's going to be a real data point plus the, the uh, generated data point starting with that real data point. So if you think about it, this is like exactly what you want to do in order, to, in order for the generator to learn how to just randomly augment any data point. So it's a, a new uniformly random point within the same class. OK. And so uh, we, can, we can turn this into a meta-learning algorithm by, by just starting with uh, all of the meta-training data that we have and feeding them into this DGAN. And at the end, we'll have a trained GAN that, that, can, uh, that can perform data augmentation for any class that it's given. And then at testing time, we have new classes that we haven't seen before, but the DGAN will still be able to augment these, these, uh, these classes even though it hasn't seen it before. So these are uh, images we uh, generated here at Reality Engines. So the, in the green box are the real images of different types of fruit. And then all the other, all the other images are generated by this, this uh, GAN. And these are for classes that, that are uh, Dagan has not seen before. So it's pretty impressive that it can like turn the banana around in different ways, even though it's never seen a banana before. Okay. And uh, we also ran experiments on, on different types of data sets. So OmniGlot again, and then a, a fruit data set, and a strawberries data set. And we found that the accuracy improves by up to 20% in some cases. When we, when we run like three shot learning or five shot learning. Okay. Okay, so uh, I talked about two different models for meta learning. Uh, MAML, which is a very popular algorithm for, for uh, uh, which uses gradient descent, and also data augmentation GAN, which uses, uh, which automatically learns data augmentations. So this is uh, based on research that we are currently working on. And uh, just as a context, uh, we presented this work at this workshop titled Knowledge Representation and Reasoning Meets Machine Learning at uh, Europe's 2019, uh, just last week. And if you go to this URL, you can find a bunch of more uh, papers and talks around related topics. Uh, pretty exciting. And uh, also at Europe's last, year, last week, there was uh, this keynote talk by Joshua Benjo on a title from System 1 Deep Learning to System 2 Deep Learning. So the gist of the talk is that uh, our thinking can be sort of broken down into two different parts. So you have uh, System 1 thinking, which is sort of fast and habitual. And uh, things like, for example, uh, image recognition and things like walking, running, or brushing your teeth sort of fall into System 1. And uh, you have system two thinking where you have things like uh, things that are uh, sort of slow and logical and uh, things that involve a lot of planning and reasoning, for example, like reading a paper or a book. And uh, the idea is that uh, most deep learning, the deep learning systems that we have now are very good at, more or less uh, good at system one uh, thinking. But if you look at uh, system two thinking, the systems that we have right now aren't that good. And uh, the essence of his talk was that a lot of advances in deep learning system will come about in the next few years by uh, sort of adding system to cap capabilities to deep learning systems. And our research sort of falls along this direction, but it is sort of more uh, practical and shorter term, uh, not that short term though. Uh, so the idea is that, let's say you have a lot of information locked up in some knowledge base or database or in uh, some external program and you sort of want to uh, add this information to some neural network that you, want to, that you have. And uh, so right now, there isn't much of an option that you have if you are faced with the situation. And uh, we are looking at research that will solve this uh, problem. 
So why do you need uh, something like this? So if you look at a lot of problems where uh, the underlying domain is evolving, for example, if you look at uh, something like fraud detection, uh, the data that you have might not reflect the patterns that you have in your domain. Uh, for example, in fraud detection, uh, for a lot of uh, evolving fraud patterns, you might not have uh, training data to train uh, for those fraud patterns. Uh, and this is something that I personally went through a couple of times uh, in the last few years. So, for example, you can have a pattern that looks like, looks like this. Uh, you, have, you use your credit card at a bunch of locations in uh, place A. But within a few minutes, uh, your credit card gets used in another place uh, that's a few hundred miles away, uh, at another physical place a few hundred miles away. So ideally, you want to uh, tell your machine learning system that this shouldn't be happening. You want to sort of uh, talk to it and sort of add a rule or uh, uh, constraint that says if something like this happens, then uh, that's probably a fraudulent thing that's happening. And uh, I have another couple of examples that are based on visual question answering. So if you go to this uh, website, you can sort of try a lot of similar things like this and have fun. So uh, this is uh, from a demo image on the website. And I think this is, one of the, uh, this is from one of the uh, state-of-the-art models. So <laughs> if you ask this model, what is the man eating, it will tell you it's pizza. That's correct. And it's pretty impressive. And, uh, but if you ask the same model, uh, just a couple of seconds later, uh, <laughs> is that a man? And it says no. <laughs> and this is 2019, and possibly the model could be politically correct, so I wanted to be sure. And I asked, what is the gender of the person? And it correctly answered male. So it knows that there's a male and that that male is eating a pizza, but it believes there isn't a man in the image. And I tried another image. I tried a bunch of similar images, uh, different images, and got similar results. I added just one more. Uh, so there is a cup in this image, and if you ask it, are there two mugs? It correctly answers no. But if you were to ask it, are there more than two marks, then it says no again. And if you were to ask it, are there less than uh, two marks, it answers no again. So it, it isn't sort of self-consistent. So it uh, sometimes gets answers right, but it, uh, if you probe it more, it gets uh, things wrong. And uh, e even if you look at uh, machine learning systems that are sort of trained to be good at uh, things like inference, uh, they get a lot of things uh, wrong. For example, if you look at uh, NLP models that uh, are uh, good at inference, uh, and if you ask them, and if you sort of give them a bunch of uh, sentences like this, for example, if you look at these three sentences, uh, you have one sentence here that says, John is on a train to Berlin. And you have another sentence that says, John is traveling to Berlin. And you have a third sentence that says that John is having lunch in Berlin. Uh, so you can sort of see that uh, sentence one implies sentence two, but uh, sentence two and sentence three contradict each other. And uh, sentence one and sentence three contradict each other. So if John is on a train to Berlin, he can definitely not be having uh, lunch or dinner in Berlin at the same time. So in this uh, paper which was published this year, the authors went through a number of uh, such sets of sentences. And they found that if you sort of add constraints like this, uh, the performance of a lot of state-of-the-art NLP models decline. And uh, they, uh, one of the solutions that they propose is they add logic to these models, and they show that the performance sort of jumps up, even when you have lots and lots of training data. Our work is sort of similar to what these uh, authors have done. And uh, my last example is sort of my favorite example. So let's say you are building a self-driving car. Uh, you can sort of, I mean, the car definitely needs to obey the rules of the road. So you have two possibilities. You can either have the car learn uh, a lot of these rules from just going around the world and uh, sort of uh, breaking a lot of these rules by like driving on the wrong side of the road. Or you could sort of manually code these in uh, uh, programmatically. Uh, both of these are not ideal. And ideally, you would want to sort of uh, state these in a clean format expressed in logic to the system. So that's another final example. So these are the, the different examples that sort of motivate why you might want to have logic added to neural networks. So how do we do it? Uh, so the idea is that, uh, the key idea is that sort of uh, deep learning systems right now only learn from examples. But in many uh, applications and domains, you have uh, information that is not uh, contained in examples, but is sort of expressed as knowledge outside of examples. 
And uh, we want to add this knowledge uh, to the neural networks that we are working with. And uh, how do we add it? We add it through logic. And uh, just uh, a small overview of logic. So logic is uh, more than if then rules. Uh, and uh, there are actually many logics, so it's not just one logic. And uh, they go by many names. So if you have taken any uh, courses in logic, these are the two logics that you might have studied. And then you have uh, first order logic, which is sort of uh, very commonly used in many different domains. And one of the cool things about first order logic is that uh, it's powerful enough to do a lot of things. Uh, for example, it can sort of represent and capture most of, most of the math that we do in everyday life. Uh, there are some things that you can't do in first order logic in math, but uh, it sort of gets 90 to 95 percent of, or even 99 percent of math that, it, that we deal with. And uh, more importantly, all the computer programs that we sort of write uh, can be represented and simulated in first order logic. So if you're looking at adding uh, information uh, and knowledge to neural networks, uh, then first order logic is a good uh, vehicle to do that. So what is first order logic? So at a very high level, uh, in first order logic, you have uh, formulae that you, or formula that you use to represent information. And you have reasoners that go by various names. Uh, sometimes reasoners are called theorem provers or inference systems. And what you do is you take in a bunch of these uh, formulae and you give this to a reasoner. And the reasoner can either come up with uh, one or more formulae that follow from those uh, formulae that you gave as input. And uh, here is an example. You have a reasoner. Uh, there, are, there are dozens of uh, reasoners for first order logic. And there are even competitions that happen every year for these reasoners. And uh, we have a formula here that states that uh, every human is mortal. So if that's an X, and if that X is human, then, then that X is mortal. And then you have another formula that states that John is human. And if you give this to a first order reasoner, it'll come out with a formula that says that John is model. So this is a very high level overview of what uh, first order logic can do. And uh, going back to our first example, what can we do with it? So uh, just as a refresher, we had this uh, fraud example where you use your credit card in one location and then it gets used in another location uh, almost immediately. And uh, you can sort of express this situation in first order logic like this. So you say for every card and locations or places P1 and P2, uh, you say that if it's used at P1 and P2 at roughly the same time, and if the distance between P1 and P2 is greater than some threshold, then you can say that the probability of fraud is directly proportional to the distance between P1 and P2. And this uh, can in turn interact with some other machine learning system or some other system downstream. And you can sort of add probabilities or uh, weights or confidence values to these uh, rules like this. There are many variations of fast order logic that uh, handle probabilities and uh, uncertainty values. And in the second example, we saw this guy eating pizza. And uh, we had a neural network that knew that, there was a, uh, that this person was a man. And the thing that he was eating was pizza. But it didn't tell us, uh, it didn't believe that there was a man. So we can sort of infer this directly from these formulae. So this, uh, this says uh, there exists an X and there exists man. So translated into English, it says there is a man. And uh, in example three, we saw uh, that uh, there was one cup. I've slightly modified the example to put two cups. And, uh, we want to say in logic that there are exactly two cups. And uh, this is how we do it. So we say there are cups C1 and C2, and they are not equal. So this part gives us that there are two cups. And the next part gives us that uh, there can't be more than two cups. There is no third cup. So this uh, entire formula states that there are exactly two cups. And if you feed this into a reasoner, you can prove a lot of things. But one of the things that you can prove is uh, that is not uh, more than one cup. Sorry, that isn't exact. That isn't one cup. Sorry, that's a typo there. So 
So it looks like logic can express a lot of things. So what is the difficulty that we are faced with when we want to add logic to neural networks? So we face sort of two main difficulties. Uh, the first difficulty, key difficulty, is that logics are not differentiable. And in order to have something uh, work in a neural network or a deep learning system, you need uh, very broadly for that thing to be differentiable. And the second important thing is that reasoning in many uh, useful or expressive or powerful logics are not easily scalable. So reasoning in logics are sort of, uh, they proceed in a highly nonlinear fashion. And it's not easy to parallelize uh, reasoning that happens in logic. So we can't easily uh, convert reasoning that happens uh, in logic into something that you can push onto a GPU system. So the work that we uh, are going here, uh, going through here sort of addresses the first point and partially addresses the second point. So once again, as an overview, we have a knowledge base. And we want to put that into a neural network. And at a very high level, we convert that into a differentiable function. And we take that, uh, we take that differentiable function, and we add that to the loss function of the neural network that we want to add it to. So this is the high level picture. And uh, how do we get the uh, differentiable loss function from uh, the knowledge base of logic formulae? So there are two steps in this process. In the first step, what we do is we have a set of formulae like this. And we have a neural network. And what we do is we map uh, each formulae to some uh, neuron in the neural network. The idea is that different states of the network sort of assign different probabilities to all the uh, formulae in the uh, knowledge base that you have. And once you have this, you can sort of uh, see that different, some of these assignments of probabilities lead to violations of the knowledge base. So, you, uh, so by a violation, we mean that we can derive something that's inconsistent, like a false statement. And from these violations, you can sort of uh, look at the relevant parts of the network that lead to these violations. And you can uh, get these small differentiable functions that you then combine into one uh, big function by just summing, up, summing it up. So this is a little bit abstract. I'll go through a small uh, toy example. Uh, so let's say you want to uh, build a neural network that takes in uh, images of single digits and uh, outputs whether the digit is odd, even, or uh, divisible by four using uh, three separate outputs. So these are MNIST digits, and it goes through a network. And uh, in this case, the answer is correct. So the network said that this is even and uh, divisible by four, but this isn't odd. So let's say you want to sort of help the network uh, in this problem, with this problem. So what you would do is you would write down formulae that says something like this. So the formula, the first formula here that says that if something is odd, then it can't be even. And you can sort of flip it around to say if something is even, then it can't be odd. And the second expression here says that if something is divisible by four, then it's even. Pretty simple. And what we then do is we sort of look at uh, different states of the network that uh, violate these uh, formulae. Uh, for example, you have this one state that says that something is odd, even, and divisible by four. So corresponding to this state, you have this small function. And uh, you have this uh, other state that says that something is divisible by four, but it's not even. And uh, you get, finally, another state that says that the input is neither odd, neither odd or even or uh, divisible by four. And uh, you get another function from this. And then you just sum up all these functions, giving you one function that sort of tells you uh, how close the network is to violating the constraints in your knowledge base. So there's a bunch of math behind this. I'll just skip it over, go over it. Uh, and uh, we do this automatically. We don't just uh, sort of go through each network and uh, logic formulae. And uh, there are two components to the uh, uh, automation here. So one is a reasoner. Uh, we use a reasoner known as uh, Vampire. It's sort of the champion of uh, first order logic reasoners. It sort of has won almost every reasoning competition in the last 20 years. And uh, the output function that we get from uh, this system is 
can be very big initially, and we use uh, this uh, cool method known as, oops, uh, quine Michalski method to compress the output, output function that you get. And we have a lot of experiments in the paper. I'll just go through one of them. So we looked at object uh, detection using MNIST data. So more specifically, we looked at images that have a number of objects, and we want our deep learning system to sort of output what are the objects in the input image. And uh, we can have a bunch of these like this. And these images all satisfy some constraint. For example, you can have, uh, you have these constraints. So the first constraint says that in each of these images, we have at least three objects. And uh, the second constraint says that uh, each of these images uh, should contain one complete set of uh, clothing. So there should be an upper wear, a lower wear, and footwear. And finally, we have a constraint that says only some of these items can be classified as upper wear or footwear or lower wear. So these are the constraints. And uh, one additional condition is that some of the labels in the training data might be missing, or uh, they might even be wrong. So given these constraints in English, we can write them down in this uh, language uh, that is used in a lot of uh, logic systems. It sort of looks like Python, so you look like it. So you can sort of directly write down code that, uh, for the constraints that you want to express. Uh, for example, uh, this constraint says that uh, there are more than three, there are at least three objects in the image. And uh, this constraint says that there should be uh, a complete item of there should be one complete item of clothing in the image. So given these uh, formulae like this, a compiler takes in these formulae and then compiles them down into a differentiable function. Uh, it's a Python function here that you can then add to your TensorFlow, or Keras, or PyTorch uh, models, uh, along with uh, some other loss function that you might have. And this seems to work quite well. Uh, so we have here results on our one CNN model that we added the loss function to. So the x-axis here is uh, the total training data, and the y-axis is accuracy. And uh, the line here, this curve shows the model with the complete total loss function. And all these uh, smaller, all, all these lines below here, they show uh, the model with some parts of the loss function, but not the whole loss function. And uh, one of the lines here below is the baseline. So it shows even with a lot of data, adding constraints uh, helps the model. And uh, this is another variation of that uh, previous experiment where we look at uh, the component of the loss function that has logic in it. So you, it can either be zero, so in that case you don't have any logic in the loss function, any constraints in the loss function, or uh, it can be one, where you have a lot of uh, logic in the loss function. So all these uh, lines with different, with different uh, colors, they show different amounts of training data. So as, as you can see, with uh, logic constraints in, the, in your loss function, it helps your model uh, classify things better. So that uh, brings me to the conclusion. So the key idea is that uh, one of the big next steps in machine learning will be incorporating system to reasoning, most of which is uh, logical reasoning. And uh, even though a lot, we need to do a lot of research in the next few years, uh, we, you can still use logic in existing machine learning systems. Uh, it's not as uh, cool as uh, very high level system to reasoning that humans do, but it can help with uh, even system, level, system one type uh, stuff that deep learning systems do now. And finally, uh, one big challenge in integrating logic uh, with deep learning systems is that it needs to be done in a more scalable fashion. So there's a big question of, big research question of how do you make uh, system two reasoning and logical reasoning more scalable. So I think that's it. <laughs>